Grace, lamb and lamb. No, law and lamb, thank you. I would never got that without y'all. Law and beasts. And class number nine, is it really nine? 19 is really? Yeah. Are we close to being done? Because no. I've been gone a bunch, so we may have to go another semester. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Uh, let me just um, read some, Lord willing. Never works out really, but if I can just read some and get a little further down. So I will try to not comment. The uh, subtitle is Comparing the Testaments with the Book of Revelation. Oh, I guess I have to comment because we have a chart on the board. <clears throat> and in that chart, we have the Old Covenant, the New Covenant, and the Book of Revelation. And what I want to do is, in these next couple of paragraphs is I want to compare those and I want, to, I want us to look at a very broad scope of what they all, all three represent. And what is the simplicity of it? And with that simplicity, hopefully it will help us to, to go into it with that simplicity and lay that template over it, and you'll just see it everywhere. <clears throat> all right. Comparing the Testaments with the Book of Revelation. When you consider the Old Covenant system, it involved two kinds of death. And there is your key right there, two kinds of death. There was the death that was brought about as judgment and punishment upon those who broke the law. So we're talking about Old Testament, Old Covenant, or we're talking about law as opposed to grace, or law as opposed to lamb, particularly. Um, death in this form was always to be feared and avoided, because why? If you did wrong, you would die and you'd be separated from God forever. But there was another kind of death instituted at the same time. The law was given. It was all given at one time. The law was given, and so were the offerings. It was sacrificial death. God gave the ability for the offender under the law that deserved death to be both free from death and to be saved by death. So you're looking at two kinds of death, and it's important to, to comprehend this because it explains the law, it explains the old covenant, it, it explains much of the events, or well, it expa explains the old covenant in the Old Testament, and it explains much of the events that took place. <clears throat> um, so I'll read that. God gave the ability for the offender under the law that deserved death to be both freed from death and to be saved by death. Okay, so what we're seeing here is the importance of death <clears throat> um, in the scriptures. <clears throat> um, and to be saved by death by this new kind of death. Therefore, we might conclude that the law is all about death, death in its two forms. <clears throat> so, you can pretty much mark any time that somebody was struck dead, for the most part, that was usually some offense that they did where they broke the law of God <clears throat> and there was death. But then at the same time, all throughout that same Old Covenant and Old Testament scriptures, you found there was offerings that offset that death. So again, to say it correctly, there was a death that offset death. Everything comes out of those. <clears throat> In the New Covenant, so we're moving now from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant. In the New Covenant, we find the fulfillment of these two deaths that are found in the Old Covenant. So the, we know that the New Covenant um, is the fulfillment of the old. But now we're going to see the, the reason for that. Um, so the old covenant was a shadow, and the new covenant is the fulfillment. Christ brought in a death 
he brought in a death for all men, both Jews and Gentiles. That death on the cross became the avenue for all men to be freed. Okay, freed, not merely for our offenses, but from the fallen nature that causes those offenses. So <clears throat> in a sense, you could say that in the new covenant, Jesus went a step further. In the old covenant, something died you know, for you, and in the new covenant, Jesus died for you, but in the old covenant, it basically covered sins, but it really didn't remove them, and it certainly didn't deal with the old nature. In Jesus' death, it removed sins, the consequences for sin, the punishments, the, uh, the resulting in hell or whatever, and um, it also took away the sin nature. Okay, now that's, that's important because that's one of the big things we're going to see in the book of Revelation. <clears throat> and I'll just mention it here. In the, in the very beginning before man sinned, before there was a mention of the devil, there was only mentioned God's heart. Let us make man in our own image and in our likeness. Um, he desired something that had his image. Um, it is not good that man should be alone, and let's make one after his kind. So is, there is this ongoing theme, even before sin and all that, that's in God's heart. And it's, <clears throat> we, can, we can see it in the book of Genesis, and we can say, okay, now I see it, and I understand that. But I challenge you to go through, and I'm going to do it in the, um, in the book of Revelation. I'm going to do it, and I'm going to show that the real contrast of these two deaths has to do with what kind of death. You can say death number one or death number two. Death because we didn't have his image or death because we do have his image. Death according to his nature, self-giving death. Okay. Okay which certainly happened with Jesus. Um, so now we're going to just discuss the book of Revelation in the same light that we have been. Even so, in the, bo uh, the book of Revelation, we discovered that the whole theme is also intertwined with this subject of death. The whole book, think about it now, just think about what you know of the book of Revelation. If nothing else, most people know that it's all about death and it's killing off all the bad guys. <laughs> I, mean, if the, I mean, if that's all we know, that's a step in the right direction. It's pretty much about death. But we shall read on. Uh, throughout the book, we notice that either one of two groups seem to be facing death. This is still the book of Revelation. The two groups have been variously described as lambs or beasts and their followers. This is a major key to understanding this most unusual book. All right, so I'm going to address the chart behind me now, but I'm going to read this paragraph. <clears throat> there are some important differences between these three examples, the example of Old Covenant, New Covenant, and Book of Revelation. The Old Covenant represents the positive kind of death being carried out by lambs, calves, turtle doves, etc., as pictures of the Lamb of God that would come one day. All right? All, every lamb, every, everything that was ever offered was only a shadow and was picturing a s pure, selfless death done by the Lamb of God. Uh, the Old Covenant presents the positive kind of death <clears throat> being carried, let's see, am I I'm still in the water? Yeah. The Old Covenant represents the positive kind of death being carried out by lambs, calves, uh, turtle dove, etc., as pictures of the Lamb of God's death. And the New Covenant represents that death as fulfilled by the lamb there on the cross. But now comes the difference. Now comes the difference between the book of Revelation and these other two examples. In Revelation, 
the positive death is being carried out by those who have taken the nature of the lamb, Christ in them, the hope of glory. We see the lamb on the throne after his once and for all completed death. Jesus died once for sin, and, that's, and, he, and he finished the work. He finished the work. So there is no more work. There's only conformity to him. And, and if most Christians understood that, that would revolutionize their thinking because they, uh, there's, you know, even if they believe that Jesus did a finished work, they still work somewhat to be acceptable to God. Or <clears throat> even people who believe as we do could see that in a slightly different light and say, well, the work isn't finished because we're still being conformed to the image of Christ. But to be conformed to the image of Christ is not a work. Uh, and if it is, it's not our work. <laughs> it's the work of the Holy Spirit, okay? Um, <clears throat> in, that, in that he died, he will die no more. But he desires that his self-same image be formed in us that he might be seen in his body and in his bride. So in that statement, we are seeing the fulfillment of, what, of Genesis, the first chapter, verse 26, and why God created man in the first place. His purpose for creating us wasn't to be Christians, wasn't so that a devil could get loose and turn everybody, you know, make, every, make everybody fall, the human race fall, and then Jesus rush in and save us. Jesus saving us even is meant to be a picture so that we can comprehend the image of God. So that we can comprehend the image of God. So what would be revolutionary would be this fact of comprehending that ultimately his desire for us, mankind, is to be conformed to his image not just saved because he wanted that before man was lost. And that wasn't, that wasn't some sort of a law decision on his part. I want to make someone after my image. That wasn't some sort of a fix it, you know what I mean? Fixing the, something, you know, because God's always fixing all of our stuff. You know, he's primarily a fixer in most of our relationships, and we're the ones who, who get all the benefit from that. <clears throat> but, um, but when we comprehend it outside of the fall, outside of the law, outside of, of any failure on our part, we realize that he had something that he would accomplish in us and to us and even for us if we would let him, if, we would, if we'd let him. If we, but see... You got to understand what that is. You have to understand him. You have to understand him. And if you understand him, you will, uh, you will be able to bow down in a right spirit. Not religiously. Not religiously. Not, not to a God. But to one who wants a bride or to one who wants a body or to one who wants us in his image. And you'll find, uh, you'll find that's the, that's the greater, greater love. That's the, that's the thing that his heart is set on. All right, so, so let's just look at the chart on the board. Um, Old Covenant, New Covenant, Book of Revelation. So we talked about uh, two kinds of death. One is death for offenses, and the other one is an uh, unselfish death. Death, number one, and number two, however you want to label that. <clears throat> and in the Old Covenant, the death for offenses was for the breaker of the law. If you broke the law, you were punished. If you broke the law, you could have been killed, I mean, stoned to death or whatever. It, um, this was a very prominent, huge part of the law. So you're going to have to set something in contrast to that. Anyway, let's go ahead and go down this first one. In the New Covenant, 
we say the death is for rejectors of Christ, that Jesus has already bought and paid for our sins, and now the only sin is to reject Christ. You ever heard that before? Good, because I've done it before. <laughs> Yay! Uh, because, you know, I mean, if you sin right now, your sin is already covered, right? I mean, we need, to have, we need to have some assurance of faith around here, <laughs> you know? And then we ask forgiveness and what have you, but <clears throat> the truth is Jesus, every time we sin, Jesus doesn't have to get off the, car, the, the throne, go walk to a cross, and die again for that specific sin. It's done. It's a finished work. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, so... Um, but in the, in the book of Revelation, it is this death, this death for offenses. The offense is, and the death is for beasts and the image, uh, the, the, the followers of his image. Okay, now think about that. If, if you know the book of Revelation, think about that. That it really primarily, you know, and yes, there's a great right throne judgment and other judgments. I mean, the book of Revelation is full of, I mean, you got the, 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 the seven seals and the seven trumpets and the seven bowls. Uh, you, you've got so many things that are going on in there. Wouldn't it be important to understand what kind of judgment's going on? Instead of just, I don't know, or just read it and go, well, this, this book's hard to understand. <laughs> well, yeah, but it's not hard if the Holy Spirit starts opening our eyes. Amen? So, this has to do with image. And just to, something I'll bring up later and really get into, most people are afraid of receiving the mark of the beast. Uh, have, have you ever heard of uh, a movie or a book called Left Behind? Um, and the big fear is, I don't want to receive the mark of the beast. Oh no, I don't want, I don't want, you know, I don't want to receive the mark of the beast. It's not even, I don't want to be around the beast, it's I don't want to receive his mark. I mean, really, I mean, the, the, the whole deal is let's not get the mark, let's not get the mark, you know. But I got news for you. We always leave something out of the wording. The beast and his image and his mark. His image is second before the mark. And it's an issue of image. Do we have the, in the book of Revelation, do we have the image of the lamb? And that's the whole buildup. That's the whole buildup in the, in the first bunch of chapters. Do we have the image of the lamb? Do we, have, do we have his mark? Did you know that there's a mark to be received for the image of the lamb in our forehead? Do we have that? Have we got it sealed? Because, um, you know, we're going, don't open the seven seals. Well, the seven seals will help you to be sealed. <clears throat> but they will. Um, so that's, that's the first death. The death for offense is seen in different lights. Under the law, under the New Testament or New Covenant, and under the book of Revelation. So when it's all being wrapped up, this is the issue, the image that you have. And whatever image you have, you'll receive the mark for it, by the way. So if you're worried about, I'd start worrying about the image. <laughs> All right. Uh, death number two, an unselfish death as seen in the Old Covenant. There were lambs and calves and doves and goats and different things that were offered. And they were offered, they were innocent. They were meant to be without blemish, without spot, which meant that they were, they had nothing that they did wrong. They were usually a lamb of the first year. Anybody ever seen a lamb of the first year? 
You saw some in Ireland, didn't you? <laughs> um, the whole point was that those offerings and the things that were offered would look like or reflect a certain image. And that was the Lamb of God that was to, to come. Okay. So, but they were only a shadow. All right. But under the new covenant, the Lamb of God himself came. And, you know, you see that with John the Baptist. John the Baptist, uh, in what is it, the Gospel of John, he says, uh, I knew him not. Now, you know, the, remember that Elizabeth and, and Mary were yeah. related, and John and Jesus, John the Baptist and Jesus were related. But he says, I knew him not. I didn't know that was him all those years. I knew him not except heavens opened up, a dove descended on him, and the voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. But apparently... John saw more than what is just uh, verbally stated in, in that portion and in Matthew, Mark, and Luke also. Because, and we say, where do you get that from? You know, where do you get that kind of crazy stuff from? You're just seeing stuff into the scriptures. Well, it's based on the Gospel of John where John, that John starts talking about John the Baptist and he sees Jesus and he says, behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. And then just a few verses down, about five, six verses down, it says the next day he, say, he seeth Jesus walking. And this time he only says, behold the Lamb of God and his disciples left John and followed the Lamb of God. Is that right or wrong? Okay. John at that time, especially at that time, because that was the beginning of Jesus' ministry, seemed to be the only one who even remotely came close to identifying his true being in nature or his true image. The only one. Later on, Mary of Bethany clearly identifies him in relationship to his death. Jesus responds in a, in a magnanimous way and is blessed by it. But, but at this point, this is early on. I mean, we read it and see, we, we already know he's the Lamb of God. We already know he died on the cross. We already know our sins are forgiven. So when we read it, he goes, behold the Lamb of God. Uh, you know, walking, and they follow the Lamb, and we go, yeah, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, Jesus is the Lamb of God. Nobody knew that. Nobody had even, for the longest time, look at Jesus even talking about his death with the 12 disciples, and they're all, you know, Peter rebukes him, you know, says, no, not so, Lord. Remember? Not so in the Lord, don't, don't use that in the same breath. It's just, it ain't right. <laughs> All right, so, um, so we see the Lamb of God and the fulfillment, first of all, of the image, and then the fulfillment of the Old Covenant. But wouldn't it be more important that we comprehended Jesus first as the fulfillment of the image of God. And it says that in Hebrews, and it says that in Colossians, and it says that in other places, that he was the express image of God, the express image of his person, of God, three in one. This is the image, the express image. This is the image of God. And he came to die. For this cause came I, Jesus said. So there is that. And then finally in the book of Revelation, um, the unselfish death, this is where it's different than the other two. Now, in the first, the first one in the Old Covenant, it was a shadow 
but it was a shadow of Jesus. Do you agree? In the new covenant, it was him manifested as the Lamb of God. But in the book of Revelation, it is a story, a book written for those to show those who would lay down their lives by that same nature, who were taken on that image, and in those circumstances and situations died. Okay? It's not about Jesus dying because he's on the throne. He's resurrected. He's died. And it's not about us dying in such a manner that it's redemptive. Jesus' work is complete. His work of redemption is complete. It is strictly one thing. You know, you could almost go from Genesis 1.26 and skip everything else through there and get all the way down to the book of Revelation and start seeing us in his image. Skip Adam's failure. Skip the law that just shadowed him. In one sense, you could skip this, but I mean the the cross, but you can't obviously, because that's the fountainhead, and Jesus is for, the, is the one on the throne from which everything is going to flow after that. The Lamb of God on the throne, from which everything will flow. The source of everything that has anything comes out of a lamb enthroned, a slaughtered lamb enthroned, a slaughtered lamb enthroned. Very important. So this is lambs in his image and his nature, and that's where we see the, as it were, the unselfish death. As I said, it is my desire to take you as much as I can into those parts to show that. So I said, what about the death for offenders? <clears throat> Revelation presents the other death falling upon beasts and upon, well, I don't have it written here, falling upon beasts, falling upon Babylon, um, upon those who worship another image. See, we say, don't, you know, don't worship the image of the beast. Don't, you know, don't take the mark. See, it's all... It's all external to us, and it's all independent or dependent upon each person, as it were, to be committed or to be strong or something like that. Whereas, what if he's not? What if? What if God, especially by that time in the Book of Revelation, what if God is? less interested in you being committed to the Christian religion and he really would like to end this thing with us in his image. What if that was the case? But we're, we're going, oh no, you know, and oh, the beast just came to town and he's going to want me to, you know, to receive his mark. And one of the things we'll get into is the, the question is, have we already received his image? I mean, are we already walking in something that is so very contrary to the Lamb? And the answer is, if we're not living in oneness, we are. That's what we're doing. That's what we're doing. Because we are simply copying something, and it's not real to him, and he knows the difference. <clears throat> so, uh, I never finished that sentence. What about the death for offenders? Revelation presents the other death falling upon beasts and upon those who worship another image than that of the ones who have the lamb's mark and image fastened within themselves. In other words, it's not trying to avoid, it's trying to gain. Does anybody know what I just meant by that? It's not trying to avoid a mark. It's not trying to avoid worshiping a beast. It's not trying to avoid another image. It is seeking the lamb and to be conformed to his image. Doesn't it say that? To be conformed to his image. It is, it is 
positive, it is proactive, it is, um, you know, I mean, we want to be, we want to be all involved for the Lord. And, you know, again, it comes up, but it comes up in me all the time because of the Holy Spirit. Um, we may be so involved in, in uh, compassionate ministry that we just flat walk past the Lord. We don't, we don't seek his image. We think is, we think that it's not about his image. We think that it is about doing Christian things. I, do I pray? Do I read my Bible? Do I go to church? Do I um, tithe or, or give money to the church or all those things? And if we do a certain amount of those, we kind of mark ourselves down as we're doing pretty good. And again, well, I'll get into that somewhere on, on this thing. We miss, and see, to receive, to receive his mark is, oh, I missed the mark. I mean, I messed up. To, receive, to worship the beast, oh, I shouldn't have done that. You know, it's all negatives that I shouldn't have done. What does that sound like? Law or lamb? What is it? And it's the law. And we never take into consideration in our heart because we haven't gotten to that kind of relationship where we eat his flesh and drink his blood. I'm not talking about a Lord's Supper thing. I'm talking about what, what we subsist on. And we get to that place so that we realize how I am affects him, not by what I'm doing, but by my lack of heart and pursuit for him, memorial ministry. Amen? Yeah. I mean, and these are all, these are all uh, really issues of the heart with the Lord. And I forget where we'll get into it at because I'm, I'm in the middle of several different searches right now. But pro it's real possible it could be here because I've also been in the book of Ezekiel and you should hear some of the wording there that just gives away God's heart on what's important to him. And we read right over it with our religious mind and we don't see him calling out and yearning and, you know, I mean, because we're, we're only interested or we're only, how about this? We're only aware of our own yearnings and our own pursuits and therefore our own ambitions. I want to be the best, I want to be the greatest pastor in Denton, Texas. Okay. <laughs> but is that really what Jesus wants first? <clears throat> All right, so Page after page is either describing the followers of the Lamb being slaughtered or the other group. Think of the book of Revelation. Anybody know it well enough to just kind of take a quick, and you'll go through, and if it's not the two witnesses being slaughtered, it's the, war, the, land, uh, the beast made war with the saints and killed them. And it's this scene, and it's this scene, and it's this scene, and it's this scene. And you can, you, can, you can tell the greatness of each event or the lack of greatness based on when it goes back up and gives you a view from above. On the earth, Babylon falls, and everybody's going, oh, man. Image of the beast. They're, they're living off of something that is not the lamb. They have a pursuit that is not the lamb. But in heaven, everybody's going, yeah! You know? Opening the seals, just in chapter 6. Opening the seals, you know, everybody's weeping. Who's going to open the seals? What the heck you want them things open for? Do you know what that's going to look uh, unleash but everybody in heaven's going oh and they're crying we want this and there's a reason they want it because it's going to help them become conformed to the lamb and have his image but down on earth oh my god it's the apocalypse 
No! You're not thinking of that time I said apocalypse, are you? I knew you were, Mike. <laughs> You know, some things Mike just doesn't forget. <clears throat> okay, in a nutshell, this is the theme of the book of Revelation, just as it is the theme of the Old Covenant and, the, and in the New Covenant. What is the theme? What is the theme of the whole Bible? What is the theme of every different view? The theme of the Old Covenant is, if you break the law, you're going to die. But also with that is another kind of death, but I will offer you a sinless offering to take care of you. Okay? Isn't that the basic story? All right? New covenant. Jesus is the fulfillment. And he has come to redeem us unto himself. Not just redeem us from hell. Amen? I mean, the wording is, these little wordings are so important, but we read over it and we always just, we read it as if it does say, he's just come to redeem us from hell. Oh, thank you for redeeming me from hell. Well, are you ever going to get close to me? Are you ever going, no, no, not really, but I'm really thankful that I'm not going to hell. We never, and if you don't see his heart, then you're not, you won't respond. You just won't respond. All right. So, next subtopic, not comprehending the importance of death. Well, right here, everything that we've just gone over shows you death, death, all the way through on both levels. If we don't comprehend, if we stay within a Christian bubble that makes it a whole lot, kind of a mixture of the law and the salvation and nothing to the book of Revelation because that scares us, then we are, we're going to be ignorant of death. We won't even see it, that it's the, the major theme, that it's used over and over, that it is the thing that is always presented. And you could say it like this, always presenting two different images. One that is you know, Jesus or God said, let us make man in our own image and after our likeness. And then Adam and Eve fall, the fall happens, and the image is gone. So then he gives us the law to show us that it's not going to be by us. You can't attain to something that only comes by oneness. I mean, it, it does. It only comes by oneness. It only comes by oneness. And, and we say, well, I believe in oneness. <laughs> I believe in oneness. I believe I'm one with Jesus. What is that? I mean, be honest. What is that? Some sort of theological stand? I believe in oneness. Is, is it a oneness of like the vine and the branch where you, you, you're connected with him and what's in him is flowing into you and filling you so that what, what instead of the old popping out of you, his fruit, his seed, his reality starts coming out of you. That's oneness. That's what, and that's also image. That's also the image of Christ. That's also the image of the Lamb. That's how it happens. But if it's theological, then religion is robbing those who were meant to be the Lord's. Those who were meant to be the Lord's. All right. So, not comprehending the importance of death, let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Gosh, I should have checked this Bible before I brought it. Let's just read, let's start at verse uh, 23. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body. You see that? We're his body. He, he takes the bread and he immediately breaks it. 
That's what he wants to do. He doesn't want us all whole in the way that we think that we wholeness is. He wants us wholly filled with him, completely filled with him and having his nature. So this is my body, crack. You see that? He's, he's you know, you think my, my pastor door, office to my door is a cry for help. This is a cry for help. Jesus is going, this, this is what my body is like. And he says, now eat this. Put it in you. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this. Whensoever you drink it in remembrance of me, for wherever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. Okay, just stop right there. You proclaim, you are proclaiming the Lord's death. You are, you are publicly, you know, uh, the Lord's Supper as well as water baptism is meant to be a public display. Did you know that? I mean, it never was meant to, you know, somebody to sit in the room and go, I think I'll have communion. <laughs> and they're all alone. And they go, you know, mm, yes, Lord. Never meant to be that. It is meant to be a proclamation. It is meant to be a public display of something. Okay. Well, we say, I get water baptized, uh, and I do it publicly so I can be held accountable for being a Christian. It's, it's going to hold me to be accountable. Let me tell you, everybody can see you do that, and you can still go out and sin. People can catch you in the bars or doing this and that. That, that you know, it's not so that you can be held accountable. It's so that you can comprehend death, burial, and resurrection. That in relationship to water baptism, in relationship to communion, that this is a new covenant relationship where you are my body and you must be broken. You are my body and you must be broken. And he says, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. We always read until he comes, but that, that only... That only, that's something in the future. That isn't right now. Till he comes isn't right now. Proclaiming his death is right now. And proclaiming it in, not just in rituals of water baptism or, or Lord's Supper, but, but being his body and being broken and showing forth his death in the way that you are broken in the situations of life or whatever. And you are, you know, you are new covenant, but you're more than new covenant. You're in the image of the lamb. Big difference, big difference. All right, for wherever you eat this bread or drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. Why is the emphasis in the Lord's Supper upon death and not about life? Because you'd think it would be. I mean, I would. You know, I'm alive. I remember when I first got saved, I'm alive, I'm alive, you know. Praise God. You know, there was, there was a song, anybody remember? Alive, alive, alive forevermore. That's a great song, especially if you like dancing. But are you proclaiming the Lord's death? Are you? It's just a thought. There is no, there is no power in proclaiming that He's alive if there hasn't been a death, and the reason for the death, and the spirit in which the death. There's no, because what, what are you alive unto? 
You're not alive under Christianity. You're not alive from, from the dead in the sense that I, I'm, or alive from hell, or alive from, you're alive under God through Jesus Christ. You're not alive under God through you. And to be that, it has to be that image and that spirit, or you're probably beastly in many, many of your ways. The emphasis is upon death because from it proceeds life. The Jews did not recognize Jesus as the Messiah because of their hard, fast mindset of the flesh that saw that injustice must be met with resistance. Okay, so I'm sure it's probably written here. Let me just make sure. Yeah, while, while they saw death as the answer, it was their adversary's death that would answer all things. They could not comprehend death in terms of giving yourself in place of your enemies. Okay, so you have Jesus. Jesus comes, he's born. Jerusalem, Israel is under military rule by the Romans. They are restricted. They are limited. They are, to they are a restricted in terms of their movements, they are restricted in terms of their, you know, many things that the Romans demanded of them, such as being able to, um, what is the word, um, where they would just come up and say, go with me for a mile, and you had to go. It was a Roman law, and if they set up, conscripted you, they conscripted you, and you had to do that. So they are upset with the lack of freedom. And then when you put that up against the, the backdrop of religion, um, they are restricted on certain religious things because Caesar declared himself the only God. We weren't supposed to worship other gods. That was one of the big things against Jesus. Well, he says he's the son of God or whatever. And I think Pontius Pilate said something about it, and they said, we have no God but Caesar, you know. So I just, I just want to serve God, and these people won't let me, and everything is wrong, and it's been this way for a long time. We're just limited and held back from any real freedoms and stuff like that. And it's just not right. And we ought to do something about it. I'm sick of it. Are you are y'all sick of it? Yeah, we're sick of it. And that's, you know, that's where Barabbas came from, that group. Jesus comes along, finally shows up. He says, well, when they limit you, when they say you just conscript you for a mile, you go too. The second one's your choice by nature. By the lamb, you go another one. You do it in the right spirit. You do it to the glory of God. You do it because it's the image and nature that's at work in you, not because it's just another Old Testament law. See, we... We look at rules as, as such enemies. But shouldn't they just be agreements of the heart with the Lord? You know, agreements of the heart. I understand your heart, and I'm in agreement with it, and it's at work in me. They, they could not comprehend death in terms of giving yourself in place of your enemies. And that's, that's still a problem today. I mean, Christianity, to a great degree, not all of it, obviously, but there are huge segments of it, 
that everything is about resisting the things that limit your life on this earth. You resist poverty. You resist um, uh, having a lowly job. You, you know, I want to be a success. I want to be, let me tell you, I'm just going to say this. You know, a whole lot of that has to do with another image. It does. You say, where do you get that from? Book of Revelation. Check it out real close. That's, that's Babylon. That is what Babylon is. The spirit of that, that whole thing is that, and it rides the beast. It rides the beast. There is another way, and Jesus, you know, we talked about this some time back, but Jesus sitting on the Mount of, uh, of, uh, of, of Beatitudes or whatever, and he, he is saying, blessed are the hungry, not blessed are you when you get filled. Blessed are you when you hunger and thirst, when you're limited so that you can express something of my spirit. Blessed are the meek, not the bold, you know. I mean, the scripture says the righteous are bold as a lion, but it doesn't say to be a lion, and that was what that's Satan goeth about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he can, he can devour. And that's only one verse. The, the, Jesus' words are full of lamb nature. Okay, but those are beatitudes. That's what we call them, beatitudes. We don't see them in light of his nature and his heart. We don't comprehend that it, all of that lowliness, you know, blessed are the poor in spirit. You know, we're looking for, you know, you know, God help the poor in spirit or God help the hungry to be filled. God help the poor in spirit to be bold. God, you know, we, it's hard in this society to comprehend a completely different system, but it's not a system. It's a nature and it's one new man and it comes out of one new man and, and if we were still on the giving end of this, when we got to the end of, of the book of Revelation in chapter 21, where it pictures the lamb sitting on the throne and the waters of life flowing out and the tree of life, you know, bringing forth all this fruit and going into the healing of the nations, where would we be if we were still on the receiving end of this? We'd be somewhere downstream. But in the end, the bride has tra is transparent glass, and she is new Jerusalem, and he's inside of her, and it's flowing out of her as much as it is him. They're one. And he, 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 gets, he gets what he desires. He gets what he desires. She's not downstream fishing for what she can get out of it. She is, it, it, it flows out of him, and it flows out of her just as much as it's flowing out of him. Fantastic reality. All right, let's see. I think, I think we'll take a break and stop right here because it's kind of a good spot. So go ahead and take a break and uh, 